Courses are in the intersection of education, and research, and design, and technology, as it applies to library services. She has a lengthy list of accomplishments, beginning with her 2001 graduation from a college with a degree in history. And then she completed a master's of science and information systems in 2005 at the University of Texas at Austin School of Information. And then completed a master's in educational technology at Ohio University in 2008. She was recognized as an ALA emerging leader in 2007 and a library journal mover and shaker in 2008. She's published two books. The first one, Reflective Teaching, Effective Learning, Instructional Literacy for Library Educators, which you may have read. Um, it was given the ACRL Instruction Section's Eileen F. Rockman Instruction Publication of the Year Award. Her other book, Informing Innovation, Tracking Student Interest in Emerging Library Technologies, was well received as well. She's also authored numerous articles and stays connected with her blog called Informational. She currently serves the Claremont College's Library as the Instruction Services Manager and e-learning librarian, as well as serving on the ACRL New Publications Advisory Board and the RUSA Research and Statistics Committee. Her talk this morning is entitled Revaluing Libraries content, container, or concept. I hope you will join me in welcoming Charlotte. Thank you very much, and we always need to check sound because I'm quieter than I look. Um, all right, so it, it's really amazing to be here, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and I, I did want to let you know that my uh, Twitter handle is very simple, my name, our booth if you want to use it. Uh, I also already uploaded the the, these slides to SlideShare, so if you want to see them, follow along, download them, um, you know, mock them in the future, you're welcome to, they're already out. Right, so um, the original title of my talk, Revaluing Libraries Content, Container, or Concept, still stands, but I decided that I kind of needed a bit of a subtitle, yet another subtitle, <laughs> which could be. <laughs> give the keynote following part of this <laughs> right and this is this is in total jest like i like pretty much everyone else really love to read barbara's words she's incredibly brilliant uh, such a thinker such an amazing person she's also inside my head stealing all of my themes um so and that's great so what i'm going to attempt to do is really play off of what she said and what all the rest of you said um because in addition to barbara stealing my thunder the rest of the conference has been um, talking about one of the really the main themes that I want to bring out, which is this issue of narratives, right? So we've heard about learning narratives, we've heard about institutional narratives, um, all sorts of kind of points of advocacy that we're working with and kind of grappling with and trying to do um, in a positive way. But the narrative that I really want to look at first is one that Barbara also talked about a lot, which is the um, crisis narrative in libraries. So what you're looking at right now is um, an image that I was able to capture from Google Timeline before Google Timeline was eradicated, much to my demise, um, which is a, a new search for the phrase library closure between 1960 and 2010. Duh, it's gone up a lot, right? So that phrase is, is in the cultural narrative a lot more than it used to be. Um, so how I wanted really to start my talk was this idea of, so if, if the idea of library closure, library crisis, library decline is in such um, kind of vogue in the cultural narrative as one might be able to see from this uh, wonderful Huffington Post site or column or theme on their site, uh, libraries in crisis, you know, doom crying. Uh, what I want to do is say, okay, so there's a library in crisis narrative, uh, libraries in decline, library oh shit narrative. It's a pretty loud <laughs> one. Um, but the thing is, as a student of history, and as kind of a critical, uh, a critical watcher of this field and, um, and many other fields is that libraries have always been in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, they're supposed to be in crisis. And I'm gonna tell you why. 
Right, so I am not the first person to talk about why and how libraries have always been in crisis and will continue to be in crisis forever and ever now and then. There's a woman named Rebecca Newth who wrote two um, rather doom-cryingly titled books called Libricide in 2003, and then Burning Books and Bubbling Libraries in 2006. And if you're looking for institutional redesign strategies, that might be um, a good place to turn. So she lays out a couple of scenarios about how, throughout history, libraries have been targeted, challenged, eradicated, murdered, you know, flagrantly burned to the ground, deliberate destruction, um, incidental decline through cultural decline, and I'm going to add my third to the mix, which is a little bit more modern, um, displacement. So let's take these one by one. Destruction. Libraries have a tried and true history of being burned to the ground. <laughs> Why is this? This is a real question. <laughs> Cultural memory in the back. It's a way to destroy a culture in time of war. Yes, it's a way to, it's a very good way, very rapid way to destroy what is most important to a culture at a time of war. Okay? So getting rid of that cultural memory gives you a lot of power over a society. So of course this is a, a depiction of the burning of the Library of Alexandria, which happened over and over again um, for a, a millennium. And you can look throughout history and see so many examples of systematic eradication of libraries in different cultures as kind of part of transitional like spaces throughout history. Um, Genghis Khan, burning down the Muslim libraries, Henry VIII, getting rid of all the remaining monastery collections. Um, you've got every dynasty in China, every dynastic succession, routing the collections of the one that preceded it so they could utterly rewrite the cultural slate. Really kind of fascinating. Um, so libraries are always being destroyed. And this is not um, just a historical phenomenon. This is a couple of pictures of probably the largest book burning ever to occur, which was the 1992 bombing of the um, Sarajevo National Library. And one night, as an act of ethnic cleansing, um, a half, one and a half million books were burned through a direct hit to that building. This is, this is only 20 years ago. Um, and more recently, we might look to what's happening in the different Arab Spring uprisings and how libraries are either protected or targeted in times of cultural strife. All right, library decline, perhaps less violent, but no less common. Um, libraries decline when societies can no longer afford or no longer to care to keep them up. So that's one of uh, many Roman libraries that just kind of fell into ruin as the Roman Empire was no longer able to fund um, their, their different institutions. And uh, there are as many sexy pictures of that, uh, and I just you know, kind of wanted to put it out there that library decline is something that we're always uh, also very familiar with. Um, having worked in the UC system, I had to deal with a lot of furloughs um, over my, my tenure there. We have libraries being shuttered and closed and layoffs and budget declines all over the place. And you can look at this as a deliberate attempted at destruction perhaps, or you can look at it as one of many institutional um, cultural declines that are happening in our society now. I'm not going to talk about the reasons quite yet. Well, let's look at the third libraries in crisis trend, uh, displacement. And that image, um, for lack of a better one, is meant to kind of, you know, represent the internet or a digital content writ large, right? The, the, the vast deluge of it and what people think it's doing to our institutions and what it actually is doing to our institutions. And on the face of it, it looks like what we're dealing with most directly right now is kind of a nice blend of decline and displacement, right? Um, if, you, if you really look at the way trends are going in our field, in, um, in this country and many other um, hyper-developed countries, there's a lot of funding problems and there's a lot of buying media and buying formats and buying approaches that make, make people question the validity and the value of libraries um, and their continuation throughout society. Which is, I'm sorry to say, the way it should be. This should not be an easy thing to advocate for. The fact that our institutions are valuable and uh, valuable enough to be targeted and always in this kind of role of having to struggle to exist keeps us sharp. It helps us learn the best way to advocate for the resources that we need to maintain and preserve and also how to help teach people what libraries are at a, at a more than superficial level. So that's one of my messages that I want to really talk about in this talk is that, that libraries have no power narrative that um, Barbara so eloquently described is actually a really interesting way to flip the crisis narrative on its head. You gotta embrace the crisis narrative. It's not going away. It's what you do with it and how you use that narrative 
to help you forward and transform and innovate in your own work. I'm gonna get into some practical examples of that towards the end of my talk. Um, but for now, I wanna look at a slightly different thing. This is something that I often do in my presentations because I, I find it quite fascinating um, to hear people's responses to this little exercise. So, um, we've seen libraries defined a couple times over the last few days, and I wanted to look at the American Heritage, American Heritage Dictionary definition of what library is, and I just kind of grabbed it from my computer, okay? So, the very recent desktop widget uh, version of this dictionary thinks that libraries are buildings, rooms full of books, um, different kinds of collections of books and periodicals held in various rooms, cloister to know, a series of books, recordings, etc., issued by the same company, so a library has a slightly different style there. Room in a private house where books are kept, and I'm pretty sure this one had one. And then finally, a software library. So yet another collection of stuff um, in a different sort of room. This one is actually probably digital. So we've got a definition of library that um, focuses on some themes. What are the themes that this definition really focuses on? Buildings, books, buildings, books, collections, collections, organized collections. Organized collections. So not just heaps, but heaps with <laughs> heaps with meaning. That's good. What's it not um, talking about? People. People. The great robot libraries of yesteryear. What else? Activity. Activity right. So there's just the stuff just sitting there. Information. Not talking about information. It's just it's just books like. No, they're actually blank. All the pages are blank. <laughs> right, so this, like so many other de definitions, major definitions of libraries, focuses on content and container to the detriment of concepts, right? So if you dig one layer beneath that definition, you start to see um, the, the, the lack of the conceptual meaning, the bigger, the more important meaning, things that libraries in crisis are actually being targeted for the concept, right? So we've heard a lot about different cultural narratives around libraries, and what I wanna think about in my own practice um, for the rest of this talk, or at least for the middle part of this talk, is to think about the importance of personal narrative in um, building your own productive, practical, less crisis-driven narrative of why libraries are important and the work that you do in libraries, how you can actually tweak that and shape that so that it follows different strains of the dominant narrative, dominant narrative of your institutions and your patrons. And if you bear with me, that will eventually make sense, okay? So, um, I went to Reed College, and it was an amazing thing to do, and it was also amazing to go back to Reed College yesterday, two days ago, and give a presentation about libraries. This is, a, this is a wonderful opportunity and an amazing thing because not only did I actually get to return to my college and do something productive, um, I got to return to my college and pay homage to the fact that it is what gave me my own personal narrative of why and how libraries can not only be important but essential, like the essential role that they fulfill. Um, who wants to tell everyone what this is? Emily Ford. <laughs> Right, and the word, we burn our work, and the word parade doesn't really capture what this is. It's kind of this like mad, filthy, drunken, melee, burning dash through the library, right? So everything you ever wanted to do in your library, you, you totally couldn't, like, you, we just get to do it. We burn the stuff, we're all disgusting, we like crash through the doors, and it's this amazing ritual, right? So it's, the library is absolutely central to every step of the read journey. Um, in a very kind of unusual way, in a very wonderful way. And I was able to dig out the two existing pictures of myself doing this, and they're kind of like bad, you can't really tell what's going on, but on the left here, it's hand side over there, that's like me coming through the doors, I'm a free graduate, you know, at the, at the Hauser Library. And, and this, this act, like this process, this being the culmination of my incredibly difficult degree experience at Reed, um, is really what set me and many other Reed librarians up for this, this utter, <laughs> abject, unapologetic love for what libraries can and should mean in higher education, in society at large, um, and really putting that power behind that narrative is, this is where I got mine, you know? 
And so many of the rest of us, this is a little shot of the Read Librarians Facebook group, which I just think is so super sweet. Um, so many of us go on to be a disproportionately high number, actually, I think, of readers go on to be librarians and other types of information professionals because we really do want to continue to advocate for that centrality of libraries and learning um, and in the, the broader sense and culture and society. But to be perfectly honest, um, when I look back at my read experience, uh, the drug and have dash through the library was, you know, only one component of my entire experience there, <laughs> which consisted of cigarettes, coffee, beer, and that library, right? And I was not, I was not alone in that. And in the intervening years, um, you know, those three pillars have been pretty much eradicated in my life, but I do retain that, that love, you know, that, that kind of like library fire that was lit within, within me in that way. And I have this nostalgia and I look back and I think, God, I'm such a good student, you know, I was just so great and so diligent in that library and studying so hard. And yeah, you know, I did study, but I also did a lot of commiseration. Um, I wrote on the walls a lot. Uh, I made out with people in the corners like everyone else. And I slept in that building constantly, right? And this is the way that at that time in my life, this was, these were the most useful kind of measures of library love. That I could that I could kind of come up with, you know, and I, I really it was it was a place of massive productivity, but it was also not just about massive productivity. It was about everything else, but it was mine, you know. And I wanted to see if other reading librarians um, had a similar memory of themselves, like kind of like using the library then and using the library now, and if the meaning has shifted, if their own narrative about their read library experience has shifted. So I asked that Facebook group. Um, what did the read, read library mean to you when you were a student, and then how about now? And, uh, sorry Emily, um, <laughs> she was the first to respond, so she's the first to be, to be uh, called on the carpet again. Um, so Emily says that the read library was you know, a nap zone, it was a super awesome productivity place for her. She also really enjoyed the Easter beer hunt, which uh, I have been told has, is a tradition that has, has since flagged, but after my talk at Reed will probably be resuscitated. Um, and now when Emily looks back, like, like myself, um, she has a heightened appreciation for what a great college library actually can be. I mean, at Reed we were allowed to fully form and explore that for ourselves. Um, talk about, you know, all this talk about institutional structure. And we didn't even like really realize that there were people that worked there. It was just ours, you know? It was like this kind of extreme, just, it was kind of Lord of the Fly library. Um, so, yeah, and, and Emily's also sorry that she missed my talk, but don't worry, you were there. You were there. I was talking about you. Um, right, so the, the Reed Library experience was about ownership. It was about being to do what we wanted with the space because that facilitated our productivity facilitated our learning, our connection with our community. We created rituals and were able to sustain those rituals because they, you know, the rituals were kind of on fire, but they also preserved the library. You know, I mean, we took care of it, even though it was kind of you know, disgusting when we did it in some ways, but, but it was ours, you know, and it helped us pass from each step of that experience to the next. And uh, you know, most importantly, it, it was the heart and the apex and the focus of our social community. Um, at this place, like it is at so many other campuses. And in my own work, um, I really want to see all of these different uses facilitated from the student's perspective. And I also want to, like, from the 10 years later view out, the grown up view out, look underneath those uses and see what libraries are really made of, right? So under, underneath that ownership, underneath that kind of ritualistic perception, we have students working in an engaged way, an intentional way to shape their own intrinsic interests in their learning process, developing the discipline that it takes to actually know what that feels like, to build knowledge and to be interested in their own work, which is, you know, as a person who has studied learning theory, really when learning occurs, not when you're being told what to do, being told what to write, being told what to talk about, it's when you leave that space, synthesize it, and realize that you actually have ideas outside of that frame that you've been given. Pulling all those experiences together to build useful knowledge and to contribute to the culture of an institution or the broader culture in which you exist. So 10 years out, my view of libraries has, has come to kind of full circle to this fruition of you know, all of those stages, all of those steps, all of those types of use culminate in cultural memory. And this is something really interesting. If you think about libraries, libraries are made of memories. 
Libraries are a cultural institution. Not only do we house and protect cultural memory, we are cultural memory in a living sense. And one of the ways I like to try to draw this out is to ask people, what is your first memory of a librarian? Okay, so you had, a, you had a nice library barrier, and then you had someone who was willing to enable you, you know, to, to help you get that thing. That's kind of busted, yes. Uh, this is Chase. We didn't have a library, but she pushed a little cart oh. into our class and just gave Kind of like prison. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Prison to child labor, I love it. It's great. Let's hear one more. Librarian memory. Yeah, I bet. Anybody else? It's important, it's useful to think about this. Yes? The library said, come in and be quiet. My first library memory is of a woman very, very much like this. And this is actually a real life librarian who, her name is Vonda. Um, Williams, I think, and she published all these books about uh, how exciting it is to be an information professional. So I am legitimate in using her image to represent librarian. Um, and so my first memory of a librarian was the person who is my elementary school librarian. She's a very intense character, and I'm not going to say her name because I am going to put this uh, recording up. And I loved her very much. Um, she wore purple, kind of like purple jumpsuits every day with these like turquoise brass knuckles. She was about six feet tall, and she was an intense storyteller. She would like, she would, we'd have story time, and she would just kind of like forget about the book she was reading to us, and just kind of be like, once, you know, and there's still this amazingly <laughs> disturbing, you know, story, and, um, and she has always stuck in my mind as, as like a very iconic figure in my childhood. Um, and of course, you can do the same exercise with what's your first memory of the library, and it's, it's interesting to think about what really sticks in our head and resonates with us. But the point I want to make about this is that um, that library crisis decline thing means that a lot fewer people actually have this first librarian story that early in their life. Um, during those really formative years when you begin to create the constructs in your mind about what means what and how, may, how things happen in different areas and different types of, uh, types of spaces. So if um, perhaps in a larger sense, the cultural memory of librarians and librarianship um, is starting at a later age starting in a very different way than it did for you and I. If it's no longer, perhaps, you know, connected to an individual or a specific institution, what implications does that have for us? You know, I certainly know in California that um, as a college librarian, I'm probably the first librarian that a lot of my students have met before. Uh, and so I am their first, Ms. Mrs. XYZ, right? And Mr. So I want to look a little bit more deeply at my own library memory or my own library past and kind of try to tease out a couple of other themes. Um, so really, my first library memory should really be associated with my mom. I mean, she was a very uh, educated person and would drag my sister and I to the public library like every, pretty much every chance that she got. Um, so there's me, you know, at the age at which I began to use this, um, the public library in my town growing up, Denton, Texas, Emily Fowler Library is an amazing place. Actually, there's two library schools in Denton, so librarians are pretty fierce. Um, and of course, you know, I, the context in which I learned to use the library was a very traditional kind of physical books on the physical shelf. Of course, um, taught how to use a card catalog, you know, um, as, as a lesson I remember it in the, in the library in my elementary school. So we have to read the card and be able to kind of like figure out what those things mean, know exactly where to access that thing. So that, that's my own memory of, of learning to use libraries. But by the time I had made it to library school, uh, a few years later in Austin, Texas, and that's me working in the engineering library, I think, um, this really didn't uh, make any sense anymore, right? The context in which I learned to use libraries had, had changed entirely. 
And once when I was in library school, I found this amazing pile of old bibliographic instruction posters from the 1930s um, that really amazingly were being thrown away uh, by my school. Tragedy, my, my game, um, and all of y'all's game too. If you want to download these, they're available on Flickr, and there's a um, link at the end of the presentation. They're really well digitized, like giant files. You can do a lot, a lot of fun with them. There's like two dozen, I don't know, they're beautiful. But this is the way in which um, you know, library or bibliographic instruction used to happen, you know, from a physical container that points to a piece of content over on the shelf. And of course, <laughs> this has digitized in a variety of different ways through a variety of different devices in the intervening years. But you know, I think what the important thing really to remember is that whatever the content container access mechanism looks like, It is a part of the natural, transitional nature of libraries. And Barbara also did a really wonderful job of thinking about this. What the catalog card tells us is that we are always dealing with format change. We are kind of the place that guides and understands and structures and analyzes and thinks about and you know, has palpitations about the implications of the crisis of the great format transition of the last you know, um, two million centuries. So we started out with our beautiful cuneiform tablets, and we moved on to the scroll, portable of course, to the codex, to the monograph, to the microform, to any number of different types of servers and delivery mechanisms. Same deal with librarians. Whereas we started teaching in this one way, and this is by the time you know we had gotten to the card catalog, libraries were profoundly democratized. I mean, used to, it was like holes in a wall that only a few hands could go into. Now it's how it's stored scrolls. You had to have a very good pedigree to get into that room. But now, you know, we deal with a different type of access. We simply learn new ways to teach similar strategies, similar values. Where I'm trying to go with this is, when the dominant cultural narrative has more to do with content and container, and those content and those containers are shifting, are digitizing, are becoming ephemeral, are becoming less tangible, less memorable in some ways in people's lives and experiences, we run the risk of being the thing that disappears. So the content's different, the container's different. You know, actually that old style of container, that old type of access, no longer necessary, it's just gonna look different, right? But when we look a little bit more deeply, like we've been doing over the last few days, at the concept underneath the content and container shifts and how managing those and dealing with the implications of those and wrangling those has always been, always been our purpose in addition to dealing with all the crisis. We develop those, those personal ways to link our memory with the, uh, the professional kind of ethics, the professional concepts that underlie all of that access and all of the, the different kind of content container questions that we're looking at. So this is one of the, the, the thunder ceiling moments that I really, I really like. So the Library Bill of Rights is one, you know, it's just, it's just a really beautiful document. If you haven't read it any time recently, you really should. It's kind of a, an amazing thing to look at and just say, you know what, our values really do endure and our values are also incredibly unique. We fulfill a role in society, a function that no other group does. I mean, perhaps in a piecemeal way, but we really advocate for this type of Access, freedom of information, advocacy for these and other uh, related types of aims and skill sets, open inquiry, and again, breaking open that type of access to a broader and broader subset and group of people. So conceptually, how is the work that you're doing and how are the programs that you're developing and how are the institutional shifts that you're enduring are, th are they and how are they underlined by these major conceptual kind of, kind of areas of librarianship that we always have to keep front and center and help inform our work in, in whatever form that it takes, and most especially our advocacy work. Because our advocacy work now is about advocacy competition, often, for resources, for attention, and that's just the name of the game in higher ed, it's the name of the game everywhere. Things are scarce. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit again. I'm gonna look back to my read experience again. 
And I'm going to think about how the culminating project that I produced as a Reed student was supported, to what degree it was supported, by the conceptual underlying, underlying tenets of librarianship that I think really guide my work now. So I want to look at this. So this is a copy of my thesis, my undergraduate thesis, which are all fours, um, kind of kicking and screaming joyfully sometimes to do at Reed. It's a huge, major piece of work. It takes about a year and a half to produce. We work in it from about the middle way through our junior year all the way to the end of our senior year. And usually they come out <coughs> looking like a master's level thesis, if not a little bit more advanced, because we have spent so much time and so much energy and so much work on this, on this piece. It's absolutely the thing that readers have to do, and they have to do it well or they're not getting out of the door. So looking back, I know that the librarians who helped shape my experience at Reed were providing me with access. They were helping me become a more inquiring person. Um, they were facilitating that free access to information um, with a you know, pretty hefty price tag, actually. But in that context, they were facilitating that access. But when I look back now, I realize that the culmination of this project, the extent to which this project actually went, was into a shelf in this room that we call the thesis tower at Reed. So I spent a huge amount of time and energy and work in that library producing that thesis, and then I handed it off and it got stuck in a shelf, and I don't know if it's ever circulated once. You know, I should have gone and checked, I didn't actually check myself. But, so, you know, you have this kind of amazingly anticlimactic experience where you put your heart and your energy and your work into it, and you just kind of stick it on the shelf, and it becomes one of thousands, you know, tens of thousands, I think, by this point. And this is really interesting. So in addition to being on the shelf in the thesis tower, I'm also an entry in the Reed Library catalog. And I remember at the time, this made me really proud. You know, it still makes me pretty proud. This is my first publication. So long ago that my name is different. <laughs> I'm just kind of amazing. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thesis is in the tower. The thesis is in the catalog. What else is the thesis doing? One of the people that responded to my post um, in the Reedy Librarians group mentions that going back to school for my MLS made me finally fully realize how much I didn't take advantage of at Reed. And this is kind of the direction I want to go, at, um, go in now, where my personal narrative becomes kind of metacognitive. Oh my god, that thesis could have been so much better. If only I had gone deeper into the meaning of that library and understood in greater depth what I needed to do to truly produce a piece of scholarship. I, pro I produce a beautifully written thesis that could never see the light of day. So the Reed Library, like so many other institutions, is creating an institutional repository for its students' capstone work, um, other types of work. It doesn't have to be a capstone project that goes into, into, into institutional, I always want to say suppositories. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Right, and there's a little paragraph in their, in, their, uh, in their description of their repository that says, right now it's voluntary. Right now it's close to the whole community. Someday we would love to convince all of you that it would be better if they were all out there for the world to see. If your thesis actually went beyond this tiny room and was out there and able to benefit someone else. That's the subtext. And I'm sorry to say that mine could not be put in that repository in large part because it was on automobile design, and I scanned like so many images from so many magazines that I did not give attribution to at all. I have no idea what they are, you know? I was just like, oh, there's a picture of that. This picture is great. You know, and they're all in the appendix. I'm like, oh my god, like there's no way I could ever source this stuff. I had no idea I was supposed to sign it. It's an image. Who cares, you know? Um, I'm serious. I'm totally serious. And the, I was talking to the librarian when I was there, and she's like, yeah, would you put your thesis in our IR? I'm like, I'm sorry, but you would have a cease and desist letter on your hands, yeah. right? So my thesis is emblematic of a larger content container concept problem, which is I was only taught to produce a piece of content that would fit a very small container and that missed a whole bunch of concepts of what scholarship actually means at the best school in the country, this happened to me. And I felt kind of shrifted, it, to be perfectly honest. So my, my contribution to scholarship was this wide and this far as a Reed student. 
Now, I can write really well, and now that I've had a whole bunch of other training, I understand that the nature and the extent of my, re my research could have been a lot more rigorous, which is something that absolutely informs the work I do now. Okay, so hindsight is definitely 2020. So I'm gonna spend the last um, kind of section of my presentation talking about how this realization of the way that scholarship is so often put in this kind of insular, only goes so far type of context for students. You can produce work that will then hide because we're ashamed of its low quality kind of, kind of thing. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna examine how libraries can actually examine, analyze, flip, poke at, destroy some of the um, assumptions and concepts underlying that type of pedagogy. So in my work at the Claremont Colleges, um, I am a liaison to one program, um, in addition to being kind of the instruction services person, coordinator. This is a cross-colleges undergraduate major uh, environmental analysis at Claremont. It's a very, very cool experience for these kids because um, they're drawn from all the colleges, they're drawn from every discipline. We've got fine arts through chemistry, through, through physics, through engineering, through um, sociology and anthropology. So you've got a, a subset of a really bright, intrinsically motivated students who want to contribute to um, the broader field of ecology and environmental studies. <clears throat> so th those are my students that I'm really stoked. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I've tried to do with them, because many of the liberal arts colleges at Claremont do require students to also produce a capstone, maybe to a lesser scale than the one that we produce at Reed, but it's still very important. And often in the environmental studies area, it's going to be applied original research as well, because it's an emerging field and students are given a lot of flexibility to actually discover how to um, do these research practices in the field that, in which they're working. So one of my uh, real causes and purposes at Reed, or at Reed, um, from Reed to Claremont, is to encourage students to voluntarily put their research, put their work in our institutional depository. Um, <laughs> might as well just say it. Right. <laughs> Because what I really think um, is that when this happens, you're actually able to use the openness and the access that that work will actually be, be um, given the possibility to have as a pedagogical tool to teach so many of the concepts that are so often overlooked and underplayed in higher ed that have to do with what libraries can actually support in a student's learning development. Their own concept of themselves as a contributor to a scholarly discourse is, is not something that institutions are, are truly helping students to uh, examine. I think, in a large sense, this is not happening as much as it should. So for the environmental analysis program, we are actually requiring all theses, um, thesing seniors to put their work in the institutional repository. And we've able, uh, been able to work that out through a number of different collaborations. And the way that myself and my colleague, Sean Stone, who's kind of the science-focused EA person, approached this, you know, we really take this open scholarship, this pedagogy um, approach to our own instruction, speak precisely to the types of things that these students have to worry about, have to make sure that they're gaining permission for this, and you know, are you publishing um, ongoing research for your professor that? It's like this whole spectrum of truly, like very, very specific and very advanced um, research kind of like topics and techniques, and students have a vested interest in paying attention to them. And I'm gonna examine from kind of a learning theory perspective why that is now. All right, so somebody wanted me to connect some dots, I believe, yesterday. And I actually really like to use dots, so we'll see, we'll see where this goes. All right, so that dot is, um, let's say that this is just a, a read student. Any student who's gonna produce a capstone project. So they write this thing. They do this amazing project. They really care about it. It's informed by the perspective of all these other dots, all these scholars, all these disciplines, coming from different traditions, trained really rigorously in these different ways of doing and thinking. So all those perspectives go into the thesis. Thesis is finished. Thesis gets thrown into the giant black grading vortex. And there it sits, along with everything else. All the other student work that can't see the light of day because we're scared that it's gonna reflect poorly on us and our teaching strategies, which is often the, the argument that you hear when you try to convince faculty to put things in IR. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want my name on that. Well, you should have thought about that first year. <laughs> because preparing student work to live in an institutional repository, 
much more so than in a black box, means that you have to think systematically. What skills do they need to be requiring from day one, on to day two, on to day 467, on to day you know, 200,000, whatever. Like you have to think about the skill development and the scaffolding that comes into that. You can't expect a student to produce a piece of scholarship that's visible to the light of day if you don't tell them what it actually takes, what they have to worry about, why they would wanna do this in the first place, that their voice is worth sharing in a broader context. So when your student's work is in the black box, and there's other students out there, or just other researchers, other people working in other fields that might wanna gain access to that stuff. The problem with the black box or the institutional barrier, even in a place like Reed, with all of these theses in this tower, is that when people try to get to that thing, they can't. They don't even know it's there. It might be in a catalog if you're lucky, you know? What about all the graded work that just gets thrown in the recycling bin? Doesn't have anywhere to live. So what I'd like to argue is that as librarians and educators, we actually have a really critical role to play, critical pedagogical role to play, to try to break open this idea that scholarship is only produced to live in a black box, only to be graded, to help students connect more authentically, more experientially to the output of their labor. It doesn't have to be a thesis, it can be in any context. This can be using Wikipedia, this is another one of my favorite things to do. Oh, you have to write something that looks sort of like an encyclopedia entry, why don't you just go do it in Wikipedia? Let's examine all of the related things that that means, all of the ways that we can come at that type of knowledge production that will actually inform someone's search someday. So Paulo Freire had this wonderful um, analogy called the banking model of higher education. So you don't want to share? Barbara went into it in her presentation. And I really love this analogy because the banking model says that students are empty vessels and we do what to them? We deposit it forcibly into their brains like this. We cram it in until they're full. And sometimes we let them pretend like they're scholars. We let them mimic the practice of scholarship and kind of put it somewhere where no one can see. But if we actually start to be courageous enough to think that students really are scholars, and as libraries we have the, the resources and the mechanisms and the wherewithal to develop the tools that can actually remove that barrier and create a new way of connecting student work with the rest of the world, what we're doing is what the amazing philosopher John Dewey predicted many, many years ago. Predicted, he just said outright. People only learn when they get why they're having to learn in the first place, when they're able to see the impact of their work in the real world, when it becomes applied. That's when people learn authentically, and that's when they begin to truly participate as thinking and doing beings in their own society, in their own culture. So when student work goes into an institutional repository or another type of open public productive context, other people are able to connect with it. And the more open that context becomes, the more used the work becomes. And the more students and learners and doers out in the world have the experience of really participating in a conversation that isn't scripted, and that isn't determined for them already by a syllabus, by a classroom, by an assignment problem. I mean, this is thinking for yourself. This is realizing that you want your ideas to reflect positively on you. This is rigor. This is forcing yourself to be a rigorous learner. Because in the context of my read education, and in the context of so many classrooms, insularity is safety. You know, you only have to prove to one person that you're good enough, and hopefully they'll give you a decent grade, they'll then get you a job. What an institutional repository and what libraries and librarians can do is begin to equalize this pedagogical relationship between learner and information consumer. And what I mean by this is, this is acknowledging that the student producing the work, even at the undergraduate level, is just as important as all those people that want to go find it, or that are also producing that work at different levels. So we're messing with the idea of expertise here. We're messing with the idea of authority. And we're not saying that, oh, it's only the credential that makes the authority. It's saying, okay, that student produced that when they were 21 years old. Look how much promise they have. Look at the original research that they actually contributed to this field. I recognize the problems of student scholarship as 21-year-olds. Duh. 
you know? I mean, that's just the way it is. We publish and access inside dissertations all the time with just as many grains of salt. But the important thing to remember here is that the librarians are so often in that neutral exchange zone. We're circumventing, we're jumping past that pedagogical relationship that sets up the instructor on the pedestal and the student down on the ground, basically, picking up the bits that are flung to them. And I know that's kind of dramatic, but, but hey, that's my crisis narrative, I suppose. Right, so when our libraries uh, and when our librarians start breaking o open the underlying concepts um, in higher education that are rather insular and oppressive and not particularly creative, and that are actually um, stymieing our attempts to change the image of what we are and what we do, what we have always done and what we will always do can be so much informed by showing people, showing faculty, showing administrators, showing students a new way of doing this type of thing. And what an environmental analysis program, what we're finding is that since we've instituted this, you have to upload your thesis, grade inflation is gone. The students that get A's really got A's, and the students that get C's seriously got C's. And they have to live with that. They could have gotten A's. You know, we were equipping them with the wherewithal and the tools to get that A. And the student work that goes in the repository is having real impact on real work. And this is what we show them at the beginning of the term, is we say, all right, we're gonna show you what happens to your thesis when it's in the repository. Where does it go? What does it do up there? Well, here's an example of a student back in 09, even before this was required, who voluntarily uploaded her thesis, Whole Foods, Renewable Energy Credits, Green Business, and Capitalist Approaches to Climate Change. Hot topic. Right? So she just so happens to be our most popular paper in the entire repository, amazingly. Her undergraduate thesis has been downloaded in 2011, from September of 2011 to September, oh wait, no, that's the, that's the entire life of the thesis through 2011, um, downloaded 635 times, the full text PDF. She's been contacted by the New York Times to do interviews. She looks really good online, <laughs> right? So in addition to, well, she's a community builder and all this stuff, oh yeah, we can actually take a look at her own work, at her undergraduate thesis, where she really dug into what Whole Foods is up to you, right? She shows you up in, in Google Scholar. Like, this is a really amazing way, not only to challenge students to think of themselves as scholars, to do innovative work, to push themselves really to the limit and truly develop their own voice and be able to advocate for their own learning, there she shows up, you know, in this community of practice, truly contributing, not just consuming it, but putting stuff out there, making a good name for herself. Right, so that was one um, example of how I personally, and I think so many other people in this room, try to take that crisis narrative, own it, be proud of it, it's worth working for an institution that is constantly assailed. You know, we're here because we like to fight for it. We're gonna fight for it in different ways over the duration of our careers, but the crisis narrative is what helps us creatively come up with new ways of examining content, new containers to put the content into, all the while redefining the productive concept of what libraries are, and so many other related concepts that are so much in need of being kind of blown open in various ways. So that was my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>
just to repeat the question um, a little bit, when, or to summarize, and maybe cast it a little bit differently, when is the insularity, the safety necessary? Um, and am I perhaps advocating for, uh, you know, forcing learners to participate in a wider audience or a wider frame than perhaps they, they feel comfortable doing? And I think it's an excellent question. And what I would say is that there is so much room for that practice leading up to a product that is recognized as going beyond that practice. So practice, 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 apex. You know, practice, practice, capstone. Practice, practice, voluntary engagement in a broader context. I'm not saying your like horrible, you know, first year English paper needs to be in the repository. That's the hideous. You know, I would just like we don't need to go there. But what we do need to do is investigate all the different contexts for for real student engagement. And it, the forum, the the peer communication forum can take so many different um, forms itself, like uh, cost presentation. Um, student like publication at the, the campus level that's in the digital library so maybe not many people are finding it you know what I'm saying it's like there are so many different levels of engagement but the engagement is what truly needs to be investigated and I find in my in my uh, collaborations with faculty I was trying to push this you know push this engagement like is there a peer editing part of the research paper is there a way that we can um, put this student zine in the digital library. Is, you know what I mean? It's just like always like, okay, so is there a broader application that we haven't examined? And will that broader application make students think about this opportunity differently? You know, like it's, learning shouldn't just be a comfortable thing. You know, it should be kind of unpleasant in that way. You know, I, I mean, just like our crisis narrative and how it keeps us sharp, it's like you, when things are easy, you get lazy. That's my answer. Don't be cruel. <laughs> cruel to be kind. I think we can do one more question. It's a more of a comment, really, in that and it doesn't undermine any of your thought whatsoever. Oh. The library <laughs> you can say are always in crisis and sort of need to be. But okay. um, Paul Croft has done some recent research, on, particularly in public libraries in America over the last couple of decades. And in that, he's not trying to say that libraries are in crisis, but it's the whole like, he shows the shown that it, it's completely false that libraries as systems and or as individuals being a library are actually closing. Yes, hours are reduced, sometimes the branch is closed here and there, but libraries as far as going away in America, which seems to be sort of the dominant part of the mm -hmm. crisis, is <coughs> pretty much completely false. Mm -hmm. That's far. He's, he's shown the data. I mean, he's collected the data from IMLS and, and ALA and others and basically shown that this is just not the case. So the crisis narrative can be a good narrative, but we need to refocus what kind of crisis we're actually saying exists. Yes, I completely so. agree. Um, I completely agree. And I was in, in some part arguing from that perspective. Um, and I think a lot of that crisis narrative, it does happen because when people talk about library closures, it hits this kind of horrible nerve where people are saying, no, you better not. I mean, that better not happen. What would, what would happen if all of our libraries closed and then people get really upset, you know, like people out there, not us. And so part, part of the, the kind of stickiness of the cultural narrative is how disturbing the idea of libraries closing is. And that's, that's kind of good, you know, because it's making people realize, oh, wait, I kind of like that thing. Um, I don't want it to go. But it does perpetuate that dominant cultural narrative that they are disappearing. And it becomes the writing on the wall. It becomes self-perpetuating. Right. You know, if we doom cry so much, all of a sudden we're doom crying and people are like, yeah, you know, that's just, that's, that's the norm, that's the way it's, it's writing on the wall. So, I mean, it's great that people care to end up to keep libraries open, but you always have to, to have that, that kind of positive slant on it, that, that more productive um, analysis on the crisis imperative, <laughs> if you will, of libraries is that it, they're, they're supposed to be struggling always, because that's how they reform and innovate it, that's how they work best, but, <laughs> But we can't become complacent that the crisis is just the, the reality. Yeah, so I just said exactly what you said back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that great? Um, okay, so is that it? I think we're done. Okay, right now, thank you all. That was really fun. That was